What's up, fellow age groupies? Welcome to another episode of the Age Groupies Podcast. I'm Mike Ergo, and along with my co-host, Lindsay Hyken, we're here to talk to you about all things related to endurance sports from an amateur athlete perspective. We talk about how to have fun along the way and make the sport a little less intimidating. You all can follow the show on Instagram, at Age Groupies. Join the Age Groupies page on Facebook, and look us up by name, Lindsay Hyken and Mike Ergo on Strava. If you have any questions, comments, or topic ideas, feel free to email us agegroupies at gmail.com if you guys like the show please leave us a rating and review on itunes or those other places people get podcasts i want to talk to you about you can super starch you can is what i consume on the race course and for long or intense training sessions now it's different than any sports nutrition out there because they use super starch super starch is a complex carbohydrate that doesn't spike blood sugar delivering a slow and steady release of glucose into the bloodstream Stable blood sugar provides steady energy to both the muscles and the brain and controls cravings caused by blood sugar lows. I recently used this to complete the Pandemic Man 70.3 using only UCAN and let me tell you guys, I was surprised by how well it worked, pleasantly surprised. I didn't need to use any gels, anything, just UCAN and I felt great, I didn't feel bloated, didn't feel hungry, didn't have any of those intense cravings I get on the race course a lot. So, I want you to try it out too. Learn about why you should feel the pursuit with UCAN and save 10% on all your orders by using the link in the show notes or entering the promo code UCANINSPIREME at checkout. That's U-C-A-N-I-N-S-P-I-R-E-M-E at checkout. Thanks. All right, everyone. Welcome back to Age Groupies Podcast. I'm Mike, and Lindsay's with me as always. And hey. today we have a special guest, Mon Reba, who I met last year at Super Frog. It's the last year, but it feels like five years ago, given how long this pandemic is going. But Mon, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, it's it's definitely an honor. It's a pleasure, like you know, uh, being on your podcast and actually connecting with you after quite some time out of this covid uh isolation it's yeah. nice to see your faces and talk to you <laughs> yeah it's good to see you and and briefly before we go into your story and and, and it's a good one uh i want to go over just how we met and how we know you so I, I mon and i met last year at super frog like i said and it was the same time that i met melissa yuri or ranga mel as we know her on the show. And uh, Mon, you were com- contemplating registering for Super Frog like day before, but it wasn't sure if the swim was going to happen or not. And that was a deal breaker for you. But you ended up registering and you were the very last person to register for Super Frog now that it's been discontinued. So you yeah. had some crazy high number. Yeah, I think like my Super Frog is limited to 1,000 uh, uh, athletes and my bib number was 999 yeah <laughs> <laughs> just so just so because none of the listeners are familiar with that event can you guys well maybe they are if they listen to melissa but can you guys um just kind of go over what the race is and yeah and then um yeah. and then mon tell us why uh you were contemplating and why it came down to the swim sure uh, uh, Mike, you want to explain about the race? You yeah. have more details. Super yeah. Frog is the, was, I hate saying in the past tense, but was the mm-hmm. longest running half iron distance triathlon in the United States. And I think it started back in, maybe back in the seventies or early eighties, mm-hmm. but the Navy SEALs put it on and eventually Ironman bought it, but they do something really cool. So it's an ocean swim, 1.2 miles. And then it's a 56-mile bike ride up the Silver Strand, for those who are familiar with San Diego and Coronado. Beautiful, nice and flat, but pretty. And then the run, in true Navy SEAL fashion, is like at least half of it's on the beach in like the deep sand, the deep dry sand. So they really they really do it right. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful course. Uh, on top of it, like I calculated like the week before the race, like I was just doing my training run. We have like say eight miles on the sand out of the (laughs) 13.1 and like i think uh no it's a six miles on the sand and two miles probably two miles on the in the trail Uh and then like uh around like five miles on the road yeah so it's 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 like i think like you switch probably 20 times between sand trail 
road, sand, trail, road. It's it kills your legs. It and does, sand yeah. is harder to run on than they make it look in the movies. I'll just tell you guys that I have seen, you know, images of t- like people running on the on the beach, like as if it's like a an easy, cool thing to do. And when I first started doing endurance sports, I was like, we went down to Carmel for a vacation. I'm like, I'm gonna run on the beach. I got down there and I ran like a hundred yards and was like, I'm not running on the beach. It's oh, like yeah. it's way hard and it's it sucks your feet in and I mean can't keep any rhythm. So to do five miles is un I mean, that's pretty and amazing. Huge difference between running on like right when the shore break where it's wet sand. Right. That's a lot easier oh, yeah. versus the deep dry sand where you just your feet stick in there. So you can't get any spring. You're yeah. just one plod at a time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it it was a beautiful experience actually for me yeah i yeah i was like training for ultraman world championships and uh at that time melissa was in uh san diego and she was training for uberman yeah and it was just her training race she wanted to do it and i was like accompanying her and i was like should i do it or not like my coach said like you know whatever like he gave me a race is my ultraman world championships and i had like a couple of b races and there are some c races pretty much you know i didn't he didn't want me to spend any of my race fitness to any other races so it's basically put when i i was i told him i'm just contemplating and i was like okay go ahead and do but don't push mm-hmm. just go and enjoy so and when i went there uh I saw the signboard, like, you know, there was a drainage spill from that river from Tijuana and uh, no swimming allowed board. And it was like, say, 2.30 in the afternoon and the swim starts next day at around uh, 6 or 7. And I was like, oh, wow, if they haven't taken the board now, why? (laughs) I don't think the the swim will happen. So I was like, instead of registering, I started going around and like talking to different lifeguards there and then like you know did anyone swim here and blah 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 and i was like talking and i was like just contemplating trying to get their pearls and they might have made a decision and i got the you know feeling that like they'll because it's super sealed nothing is going to stop yeah so <laughs> they, we will have a swim even if it's like full drainage water <laughs> yeah that's a good point <laughs> so i was like okay I, I went ahead and like signed up i think like i had like say half an hour left before the registration closes yeah yeah and and i got pretty much the last bib so you just glossed over something which i find pretty amazing um you weren't checking with lifeguards to see if it was going to be safe to swim you were just checking to see if they were gonna have a swim and you were gonna swim if it was 100 percent drainage water (laughs) as long as they were gonna have the swim i just wanted to point that out to the listener yeah it wasn't a safety thing (laughs) it was about whether or not they were just gonna do it yeah, I wasn't preparing prepared for duathlon. I wanted triathlon. Yeah. <laughs> and what, what the cool thing was meeting both you and Mel was that knowing that these were training races for you, I my brain was tickled and I thought, okay, if these are training races, a half Ironman, you know, that's that's what some people that's their limit. That's the highest they get up to. But if these are training races, there's something there's some cool story going on here. So later, I, you know, I learned about Mel. Did a quick internet uh, Google stock on her, and I said, "Oh, she's doing Uberman. She's this person who's done the Epic Five. And then I, you know, we we connected, Mon. And then I saw that you did, you know, the Ultraman World Championships, which we'll we'll definitely get to. But it was is exciting to see that this was kind of like a half Ironman is a training race. That's I, I like that idea. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's a hard one, but like I shouldn't like uh, you know." any even a 5k is like a race and i respect a 5k run so uh out of all the half iron mans definitely super frog is the hardest uh like the other one like which was really hard was wildflower Mm -hmm. uh, half iron man because like i bonked like really bad and it was brutal climb so i i would compare like these two are like pretty yeah uh, hard ones for me and uh, yeah, uh, I wish uh, I had like uh, 
known that like I was pretty close. I got like my PR on that day. No kidding. And, and uh, because I had like so much of training yeah, uh, uh-huh. built up for Ultraman Worlds. And uh, and I think I missed uh, Iron Man Worlds by like say 15 minutes or so. I could have easily made it up if I had pushed. Yeah. But I didn't push. So yeah, but it was okay. But it was, I mean, it's, it's an experience because a lot of my local friends were racing and that every time like every 10 15 minutes you see one of your friends like that's, you know, that's the best uh, part of it you course. see him on the race course yeah and, and the best part is like first time like uh, i go and swim at uh, coronado community pool you know judy collins and uh comes and swims with me there oh wow pool. yeah so john and judy came uh they were there at the start and it's like it's like hugging them and like hey man just go and like she was taking yeah. pictures of me it was a beautiful experience. Like, you know, those legends came for my race, you know, awesome. cheered me on. So it was, it was epic. Yeah. And for, for listeners who aren't familiar with John Collins, was the person who originally came up with the idea of the Iron Man, you know, back in Hawaii, he's a Navy, uh, a, a na- Naval officer. And you can look up the story on Iron Man's website, but yeah, John Collins. And, and then when they start Super Seal or excuse me, Super Frog, Super Seal is the other one, but Super Frog, when they start that, they had a, a Navy Seal, you know, jump out of a plane and a parachute with the, the flag down, you know, to the beach. That was awesome. So, coolest yeah. race start, I think, for yeah, sure. Awesome race start. Hey, I have a question about, um, so you said you did, you were doing your training race um, at Super Frog, but you also PR'd. And so... Um, I just was wondering, so when you do a training race, it's, I mean, maybe different from regular training because you're still going to race your hardest or how, I mean, how do, how do you kind of differentiate a a training race from a race race, a race maybe? uh, Yeah. For example, uh, for uh, Ironman, half Ironman, you pretty much, you are in zone four Mm -hmm. or like even sometimes you get into zone five. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, uh, at, for this one, since I'm, I was planning on a longer endurance race, so it is very important for me to maintain that zone two, zone three mm. pace. Like, if I try to push, like you know, hard, like in the zone four, zone five, I might u- recruit a different muscle group, and mm. there's a chance that like it's like stretching your uh, rubber band and it can stre- break. Mm-hmm. So I, I couldn't risk it. So I had to stay at zone three. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I was pretty much staying at zone three. And, and like whenever I was like my heart rate or like my power was going up and I was like pulling back. And even in the run, uh, it's like it's more of a efficiency, awareness of your body rather mm-hmm. than the competitor or the time. Mm-hmm. So that's how you differentiate your training versus like racing. When you're racing, you're just like... You look at the time, you look at the competitors, you're just like going full blown. Yeah. You don't do that. That makes sense. But, but you PR'd on this course just because you happened to have had a better day than the last time or? Yes. Uh, this is the first time. Like I never raced a uh, uh, super frog. Oh, this okay. is the first time I did. And uh, uh, I, when compared to other like local, like half iron distances, oh, uh-huh. like every time I had an issue. Uh-huh. So I always like my time like slipped out. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had like a little bit better time in Santa Cruz, but uh, I can't call it a PR because they shortened the swim course. Oh, right? yeah. So I, I don't call it a PR. So this one was a PR. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Sense. Keeping it aerobic and PRing. Well, let's yeah. uh, let's back up just a little bit if we can. And how did you get into endurance sports to start with? Well, yeah, that's a long story, but like a beautiful story. Uh I grew up uh, a non-athlete. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm from India. Uh, I came here to get my master's in uh, Clemson University, uh, but most of the my childhood was like focused on academics because mm-hmm. that's what we were, you know, told to focus on. Because uh, I, I, it's uh, unfortunately not many people made a living out of sports. Yeah, and really. You, you can you can count on the fingers, like you know, the only thing you can uh, 
make is like get into some government job stuff like that but uh, you can make a good living being a sports person so obviously that was at, while i was growing up that was kind of disgrace not like not discouraged but not encouraged yeah that makes sense so Just i kind of neutral I would on it. it that way so uh i never did any sports and uh until like uh, i got introduced to triathlons through a friend a colleague in miami when i was working at an under ocean tunnel project and uh, they would they signed up for a triathlon and they said like you know oh, we are doing a triathlon and i was like oh i want to get into some endurance sport like you know do something you know do something with myself because yeah. i have uh, i started like uh, stress eating from the work and like you know a lot of things were happening in my life i can even call it like you know uh, i had like a bad incidents in my life and i was dealing with those incidents and i, I had this uh you don't have to go to a war the life is a battle battlefield yeah. and yeah. i had ptsd at that time i could I, if i want to connect with your thing so i was yeah. going through that tr- some traumatic uh, experiences in my pr- personal life so i didn't know what to do and i was like trying to see an ex uh, you know you know opening where i can like overcome certain things then when he said i was trying to take the healthy path uh Miami is a party town mm-hmm. and a lot of times I was dragged into you know I mean like you know obviously everyone goes we have like company parties or like friends throwing parties like there's a lot of eating and drinking and I was like I didn't want to go that way and uh, it, I wanted to uh, channel my energies to into some something which is sustainable and when I saw this opportunity and I was like okay I want to do this one and I didn't know how to swim so and it was less than 3 months away from the race and my friend told me hey don't worry it's just uh, 1000 meters and i was like man i can't swim like 15 meters you know go but yeah 1000 meters like no don't worry uh, i'll help you out and i was like uh, that they were like i was working for a french company there were like some french guys too and they were also like they're like mm, they're like what is this guy is crazy and like <laughs> he's training for a triathlon he doesn't know how to swim and he comes to the pool and is just like splashing water all around yeah <laughs> <laughs> so it's like they were watching me on one lane and this guy was teaching me and those guys uh, there were other four guys friend guys were like you know his good friends they were also helping me out but they were like just oh, man this guy okay let's see what he does and they were giving me some good advice too it's like hey listen worst thing is you learn how to swim and <laughs> yeah. <I was> like <laughs> <laughs> so this friend of mine zaral silva he taught me basics of swimming for a week and then he gave me this website called total immersion mm-hmm. and i used to watch videos and train at home at 24 hour fitness in the afternoon session i had a 1 hour lunch break so we had 30 to 40 minutes swim practice and then go back we used to go mm-hmm. back to work and in the evening i used to watch videos and practice and that's how i managed to do my first a uh, train for my first triathlon wow, wow. it was a beautiful experience uh, because uh, uh, there is something happened during i mean i don't know uh, i think i, I t- talked about it in other podcast too when i was swimming uh, my as like my i had like a, a the muscle cramps on yeah. my leg and i couldn't uh, kick and like with just with the hands like it was hard so i remembered like a word from a friend like you know if you are in trouble look up he'll help you out so i flipped around and like started looking into the sky so i was back floating until my muscle cramp eased out and i was doing like few strokes and flipping few strokes and flipping so at that point like uh, i had a realization in my life to move forward all you need was one breath at a time mm-hmm. so if i didn't swim at that moment i would have drowned and it would have triggered my previous trauma of drowning when i was like 20 to 23 when i uh, learned tried to start uh, learn swimming I, i kind of drowned and uh, like almost drowned in the pool mm-hmm. so i had that trauma so this was like a life changing for me like uh, learning to swim and then swimming is like how you go through tough times and then like swim across mm-hmm. and w- for you to do 
all you need is that one breath. That moment is what counts. Take that breath and keep moving and you'll meet your, finish your goals or accomplish what you started. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, there's a connection with a lot of people who take into triathlon to deal with trauma, but your, your, your trauma is so directly connected to swimming, almost drowning. So you had to overcome the, that fear, I'm sure. And re- yeah. I like how you say it, do it one breath at a time. And that's really what it comes down to. I mean, that, that translates so well into life. Yes. Yeah, it was. Uh, and after that, like, you know, I took some break. Uh, that was the first triathlon in 2013. And then again, back in 2015, I again came back into triathlons because uh, I had this ego that I'm a triathlete for a couple of years. And when I signed up for a sh- uh, short distance sprint triathlon in 2015, it crushed me. Yeah. I didn't even, I, I mean, like, I struggled to swim actually. And I was like, I, my panic was kicking in. And I was like, this something happened. You have to continue practicing it. Mm. Uh, if you don't do it, you lose it. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, okay. And then like, after that, like it, it, it triggered my interest again. And uh, to, you know, uh, sometimes you go through ups and downs in your life. And at that, that time I was again going through lows. So again, it pulled me up and then... I went like steady from there. Yeah. So you, you complete those sprints and then eventually work your way up to, you know, the Ultraman world championships. But what's in, what's in between there? Like, how do you, I mean, cause I was thinking about it. There's, so there's a subset of the population that does triathlon. And among those, there is a subset that does half Ironman, smaller to Ironman. And then th- like the smallest probably in our, in our group of, in our sport is the people who do Ultraman. So how do you make your way from a sprint to an ultraman? Yeah, that's a, it's every time I did a race uh, that always like, you know, I saw some room at the end. I still had some, some matches left at the end of my race. Yeah. Like a sprint. So I was like, oh yeah, I think I can do push a little bit more. So, and uh, one of the biggest one was, uh, uh, in 2015, I volunteered uh, uh, for Escape from Alcatraz. Nice. I was quite fascinated by that race because every time I think about uh, a race, like a swimming, that was something grueling uh, mm-hmm. race because uh, just swimming across that would have been like a life-changing thing for me because that's a, that was the challenge for me. Mm-hmm. So I went and like got volunteered on the boat when i saw people jumping off the boat and doing that race and i was like okay uh at that time it was lottery you can't get into Mm -hmm. the race and uh unless and until like you're lucky you won't get into the race so the easy way for me to get into that race was volunteering you get like additional quota (laughs) volunteers so i volunteered and i was like okay let me see. And next year, I got into that race, and uh, I was uh, I managed to swim uh, yeah. and get over my trauma or like you know uh, fear of water. Uh, this beautiful thing happened. I had two goggles uh, with me, so I saw the previous year. I saw people as soon as they jumped off the boat, they were losing goggles. <laughs> yeah, that's a big jump. <laughs> so. What I did was I was wearing a pair of goggles and I had another goggles tied to my wetsuit zipper. Yeah. So I was standing like a five minutes before we jumped. I saw a guy next to me. He was just like tightening it and he broke the strap. Oh, no. (laughs) And like everyone looked at him and everyone was looking at me. And I was like, dang. (laughs) <laughs> okay, man. Take my <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so take it. Okay, don't worry. I- I'll hold my goggles and jump in. Make yeah, sure I won't lose it. See what happened was as soon as I jumped, I lost my goggles. <laughs> <laughs> of course, <laughs> this guy took off. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't have any goggles. Like pretty much like eight seventy to eighty percent of uh, the swim I swam without goggles, and almost it's like a five hundred yards away. As an older gentleman, like he's like, 
I'm not going to swim parallel to the shore. And he just took the shore, <laughs> like shortcut and started walking. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, hey, can you give me your goggles? And I was like, well, okay, take it, keep it. <laughs> and then he left. <laughs> <laughs> and I swam with goggles for the last 500 yards. So it's swimming, like triathlons. Uh, there's so many great experiences, mm-hmm. like which you can. I mean, if I wasn't doing this race, what would ha- I have done? I would have. I would be sitting with some friends, probably like you know, watching some movie or like you know, having the same old like uh, entertainment thing. Yeah. It, it wasn't memorable. It probably out of I don't remember any of those things, but I remember mm. this. Yeah, there's right. very so, human moments where you connected with someone. Yeah. So the, I, after the escape from Alcatraz, like I signed up for half Ironman and then a full Ironman, Ironman Maryland, and then uh, I, in 2016 I did uh, full, full Ironman, and still had few more matches left. And yeah. I was like, yeah. Next day I was feeling strong. Uh, I was like. I was not, you know, um, my legs were fine. I can like do another like bike ride or like a short run. So I still had something left in me. Mm. So I was like, okay. When I saw this Ultraman after this race, like I thought it was crazy because 320 miles, I couldn't like comprehend to the distance. Because yeah, beyond. It's like a full Iron Man was like, it was brutal, even though I had a little bit left. Uh, the next day it was definitely brutal so and i was contemplating and then i found an opportunity to do ultraman florida uh, it was another three months away so i signed up for ultraman florida Wait, and started it was training three months after your iron man uh, three and a half i guess yeah after your first iron man you were like i'm just gonna go do an ultraman <laughs> yeah <laughs> sounds good <laughs> just check yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, the thing is, worst thing is like uh, you won't finish, but you have you'll have a great experience. Mm-hmm. Like I was, I re- I'm really fascinated by the journey, uh, individual journeys in this uh, triathlons. Mm-hmm. So Ultraman definitely fascinated me, and it it involved. It's not just, for example, like if you're doing an Ironman, you it's it's an individual sport. Mm-hmm. Like you are by yourself and you have your nutrition and everything and uh you have aid stations you just you plan it like as an individual whereas ultraman it's more of a team effort even though you're the one who is doing the race you need to have support of your team it's based out of three principles aloha uh, ohana and kokua ohana means family it's like you have to work as a family with love and cuckoo is like you have you will be getting help and you should be helping mm. and that's it's like it's a lifestyle thing like it, it, it may that race actually is trying to bring back the old old philosophy or like a lifestyle and it makes mm. a statement a life statement every time you do a race so uh for me, uh, when I saw that, like, you need to have a crew member, there's a lot of logistics involved. You can't just go and race. You need to uh, recruit your crew who understands you and who can compliment you, who can encourage you, and who knows about that sport. Uh, not like completely. None of my crew members had done Ultraman. What they did was an Ironman, so mm-hmm. no, none of us had uh, Ultraman experience. But still, like you know, it was a great experience for all four of us. And uh, uh, <laughs> I, I have a race report for Ultraman Florida. It's like I trained, trained. Uh, I was like training by myself all the way till the race, and. Uh, we reached Florida three days before the race and the night before the race, we got burglarized and we had to deal with all of that. And it was oh like God. one after the other, one after the other. And then it, we went with the flow, I would say. And yeah, everybody's no like, I was coming down and other one was picking me up. And like, if other one was going down, the other crew member was picking up. So it's, it's like a push and pull, push and pull, push and pull. So at the end, uh, three day race it's it's memorable and uh, uh, I really felt what 
we need in this world like you know yeah friendship love cooperation brotherhood mm-hmm. and uh, it's like when you start something with a group you all should have the same goal and passion of the same thing it doesn't matter who is leading it is our goal and it was us who is doing the race it's not me right so the team uh, team so it that's what like really attracted me and then like after that and ultraman world championships was in november i was still contemplating i did this in february should i should i and i applied and like whatever they looked at my track and whatever i got invited and uh, it was it was beautiful oh i can and only imagine that, on the big island can you break down the distances for the listeners who are not familiar with ultraman yeah uh ultraman uh florida and world championships it starts with a 6.2 mile swim and a 90 mile bike ride on day one and then you'll have like a 12 hour break and the next day again it starts at uh 6 30 7 in the morning no six o'clock in the morning and uh, again you have a 12 hour uh, uh time cut off on day two and you have to bike 171 miles and uh, on day three again it starts at six o'clock and you have a 12 hour cut off to do 52 miles so the most challenging part 52 part, miles of running yes 52 miles of running intense so, so this Ultraman Worlds is around the big island. That means you make uh, make a full loop of the island. So you start at one point swim, and then from there you bike to Volcanoes 90 uh, miles and with 8,000 feet elevation. Yeah, there's some climbing there. Yeah, Volcanoes you gain 8,000 feet. So the uh, challenging part is uh, in the swim, the first two, three miles you can, like it's pretty comparatively okay and the last couple of miles you will be like you know you'll be in the washing machine yeah basically did you say and, swim six miles and then nine zero or one yes. nine okay i thought nine you said zero. 19 i was like oh that might be doable okay 90 no okay got it. yeah, it's a long day <laughs> long day i was like huh maybe i could do that nope because I was like, that's no. not that bad of a day. <laughs> that's a long day. Don't say you can't do it. You can do it. Oh, yeah. I, I should. Let me rephrase. Want to. Don't want to. <laughs> at least at this point. <laughs> at this point. But I was like 19 because I've done a six mile swim. And you're right. Like, it's not that bad at the beginning. And this was in a pool. And it was still at the end. You just get the body just from the constant resistance, I think, of the water starts getting... So a 90 mile ride. So how long did it take you that first? Did it take you the whole 12 hours or how did, I mean, do you, do you just take your time or how do you? Um... Yeah. Uh, every year it was different. Like Florida, I um, mean, it took me like first day was like 10 and 10 hour, 40 minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Ultraman Worlds, I did thrice like 17, 18 and 19. Mm-hmm. Uh, 17. I had like a bad swim after mile three, I started throwing up. Mm. So it's like I was throwing up, uh, flipping, looking, looking up into the sky, yeah. thinking about God. I kind of took a nap for five, 10 minutes because you can just like float. And as soon as my head dropped into the water, I woke up and started swimming. <laughs> <laughs> So it now that's me. a relaxed swimmer. See, I'm worried about <laughs> sharks, so I'm not napping in the water. No. <laughs> Actually, uh, when I was napping, there were six dolphins which came by. So you're oh. like confident yeah. that like, you know, there won't be any sharks. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's like they bring some really good energy when mm-hmm. you are swimming. And yeah, that's true. Only the pe- people who experience uh, swimming with dolphins only know the experience yes. yes so i keep telling people just don't uh, go to uh what do you call sea world learn swimming and go into the ocean exactly they'll, they'll come and uh, uh say hi to you and yeah. they'll be more than happy to say hi so mm-hmm. just yeah uh so that's uh, that year like i was in 2017 i did my i was short by seven miles and i ran out of 12 hours but uh, 
I went ahead and did a uh, day two and day three. And uh, day two, it took 10 hours, for, again, 40 minutes. And day three, uh, my first uh, was, I, it took nine hours, 12 minutes to do the 52 mile run. Wow. That's good. And uh, later, uh, uh, 18 was like even more brutal because it's not just day one was hard. Day two, because of the volcanoes, they changed the route. So day two, 171 oh, yeah. miles, we had 13,600 feet of climbing. Oh my Gosh. God. <laughs> so it's like you have to go up Mauna Kea and down. Uh, a was the, and then uh, day three is obviously really hard anytime because uh, if you know Ironman course, you, um, your bike course starts from Kona and you bike to Harvey yeah. and then back. The run course is basically you're running from Harvey to Kona. So, oh, miles. Yeah. so you can imagine the side winds and walls and also yeah. the heat radiating. Yes. You're not biking, you're running. So underneath you, you have this lava field. So the heat <laughs> is radiating really at, at around 20, 30 miles. It gets, starts getting really miserable because it's exposed, right? To the sun. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 and no cover, nothing. So, it gets mm. intense. So the best part is like, I'm talking about the coach, but you're not running by yourself. You're mm. running at the same time your team is watching you and uh, they'll make sure they'll, they'll, my team was amazing. Like they, like all four Ultramans, they come, they rescue you with like, you know, when you're heating, they were throwing ice on me and like yeah. really watching me, talking to me and see like how my, psychology is like whether I'm blabbering or how am I doing so based on that they used to give me feed feed me and yeah I mean most of the credit goes to my crew members because uh, I hadn't most of the times like I miss out on a few things you need one mistake mm -hmm. to you know jeopardize the race and okay. they are there for you to protect protect you from doing that one mistake yeah, and it's interesting that the the ratio of support to person on the ground um, it parallels what uh, my experience in the Marine Corps Infantry. It's for every one person uh, that's that's fighting, shooting. There's nine people in support, and so it's it's like it seems like a similar thing with your crew. You're on the ground, you're doing the work, you're running, but you have all this support that goes into making sure it happens. And are they playing music for you at any point? Or the, is it just quiet? <laughs> You're not allowed to play music, but like you have your cars leapfrogging. Yeah. So they turn on the music like so loud that you're there. And uh, there's one good friend, like another Ultraman uh, 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 finisher, uh, like he's, he's a legend to uh, Joaquin. Uh, he, he used to, he was pacing another athlete. And he used to sing all the way. <laughs> oh my gosh! That is a man, like nine yeah, hours you, of singing. You, you, you tell him, "Hey, uh, you're keen. Can can I? Can you sing me this?" Like, all right, and he's like singing that. <laughs> <laughs> what a beast to be able to run yeah. and, and sing like that. Yeah, and uh, I see artist was like you know she used to she has like bunch of chalk, so. I mean, she she was doing graffiti on the on the highway. It's like saying, "Hey, man, go, man," and like all of that. And like you know, you run, and she writes some funny quote, and like you laugh, and then you keep running. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You so, take that and tuck that away. Stick with it for you know ten, twenty more miles. Yeah, mm. that's awesome. What's yeah. what's uh, the hardest part of 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 Ultraman? Uh, actually. To be very honest, uh, uh, getting to the start line is the hardest part. Mm. Yeah. So you have so many challenges in terms of like balancing life. Uh, you have like your emotional pull downs, and then you have to manage your finances and you have to manage your work, mm -hmm. and then get to the start line. And uh, it's it's not easy. Uh, I believe that like whoever tips their toes in the water on day one is a winner because this it takes a lot to get to the start line yeah 
So if you have done your journey right, you can do your race right. So mm-hmm. that is more important. Your training is very important and like overcoming the challenges. I mean, uh, my, uh, my first Ultraman Worlds, I came in uh, to the race three days before, the, went to Hawaii three days before, but I was working like hell. I was delivering uh, uh, different deliverables at work and I was so stressed out. I was working 10, 12 hours and yeah. training at the same time. Oh my time. god! And uh, because I was taking like almost like a week or like week off, more than a week off, so I had to finish everything before I go. So I did, 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 and then when I went there, the two and a three days wasn't enough for me to recover from the work stress. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that really showed me on day one swim, and like, it, I was strong, but the thing is. My body did not process it, process the external pressures, mm-hmm. so I started throwing up. So it's it's very hard. Like how you come to the st- start line is very important. Yeah, and then from be. there you can handle. Uh, I mean, that's one part. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, on the course, if I have to really tell, like, what's the hardest part on the course? Uh, in this world, like you have 13 climate zones on this planet. Yeah. Uh, just Hawaii has 11 climate zones. Hawaii, Big Island. Right, right. So uh, just on this, like the 320 miles, you go through six climate zones. Yeah. That... So imagine how you need to adapt. Adapt to that and like, you know, manage your body, your nutrition and everything. And then do the race. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of times people think, oh, uh, I had headwinds. That is hard. No. If your body is not adapting to the temperature and the weather, mm-hmm. the headwinds doesn't matter. Like you are like just like going yeah. down. Like So that is the most hardest part. Like on top of the elevations, headwinds, weather condition. You know? Yeah. yeah. You make a really good point. And I think that that listeners and myself and everybody can extrapolate down to smaller shorter races meaning like iron man um even or half iron man you do see a lot of people on the course that are suffering not because of the course itself you know not because of the headwinds or the exposure or whatever but because of exactly what you're talking about the logistics of managing your body in the and your nutrition and how you showed up and your in the rest that you had and the consistency of training um, and I think a lot of us put an emphasis on the end result and the emphasis should probably be like you're saying on the journey. And then if you get that right, then you can just turn over the results and just do your race and not really worry about it. And, um, I'm going to think a lot about that. That's such good advice, even on a shorter race. I just yeah. feel like we can show up, you know, um, stressed out. And, uh, I don't feel like we, I think the emphasis on the stress, I like what you said, like your body couldn't process the stress in time. And so it released it on the, on the swim. Like I've never thought about it in that, in that way of like, my body really needs to not be processing other stuff when I'm going to go do this Ironman or whatever, because that's, that's a, that's, I mean, I understood the nutrition concept, but the, the idea of like de-stressing before the race. Um, as it being a key of performance is a really amazing point that I had not thought about. So thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, but the biggest thing is like a, a lot of times, like our endurance sport, we focus on the mind over matter. Yes, mind is the biggest thing. And uh, one thing a lot of people, a lot of us forget is our body is smarter than our mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you feed your body right, treat your body right. Mind is part of your body. There is a brain in your hand. There's a brain everywhere. There's just mm-hmm. like the main mainframe is up there. But the thing is, the body has, it speaks like your shoulder speaks and then it has its own intelligence. So mm. you have to respect that. Once you respect that, like you can actually handle everything. But uh, I believe in this quote, uh, you don't race to your expectations. You fall to your training. Hmm. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a very yeah. good point. 
Yeah, because you can hope and wish all you want to do great, but if you haven't prepared your body for that, then you're right. You 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 won't. Mm-hmm. Or, or I've I've experienced kind of what you, a little bit of what you experienced, where I've ended a race pretty much fresh. And it was a race like I was supposed to be because my own expectations, like I basically sold myself short. So it could be the reverse. Like you could yeah. fall to your, your um, training or you could have had good training because I had coaching and I had good training and I, I did not have high expectations for myself. And because of that, I didn't press on the race. Yep. And I just finished fresh and my coach was like, you should not look like this at the end of the race. <laughs> you should have, you know what I mean? It's like, I think you didn't, you know. And, yeah. I think you did the right thing. You should enjoy your last two miles of the finish. <laughs> yeah. That's how it has to be. I like it's that too. It's not about like the time, like how much, how many moments you gather in the last two miles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, my entire focus at Ultraman, uh, like, you know, I wanted to enjoy, my team has to enjoy. And the biggest uh, thing I always look forward to is at Ultraman, we have this thing called Ultraman Beer Mile. <laughs> so, so the day after Ultraman Wolves, we started, like, you know, all the group started the Beer Mile. So we gather at one, like, secret spot and uh, you have a beer, run quarter mile, come back, have another beer, <laughs> quarter mile. So, yeah, it's like, uh, that's that's more fun. Like, you know, yeah. you all, like, as a, as a family, you get together and you do all this stupid stuff and then, and you just disperse. So, if I'm, like, suffering on day three, I can't do day four. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> that's a good point. That's a good point. You got to save yourself with that beer. I, I have one other kind of a question. Um related i've shared on the show personally about being um, a minority one of the very few african americans i see on the course and i think i see even less in um east indian people on the course yes i've seen maybe two or three i think over my whole time period and um i just wanted to kind of get your take on that how you feel about that um and also, you know, just kind of, do you celebrate if you see another? Because when I see another black person on the course, yeah. we're like, look at, we're out here. So, I mean, <laughs> I just want kind of want to hear your cultural take on that. Uh, we have a nod, like when we see an Indian. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe sometimes this. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there are very few Indians. Like, uh, I could, when I started in 2015, I could count on my fingers how many Indians were there. And there were a few of them were really good. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was the first Indian ever to do Ultraman World Championships in 2017. I was the first one. I was like, I was pretty stoked. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah. You know, being a non swimmer, non athlete, yeah, coming no all the way, it's like, uh, I, I kind of, that gave me some bragging rights. So it's yeah. like, out of 1.3 billion people, I was the first one to do Ultraman World. Yeah, yeah <laughs> no kidding. Amazing. No kidding. <laughs> so, no, it's a, you know, it's it's a good thing. Uh, and then, like, a, next year in 2018, we were three Indians doing Ultraman World Championships. Oh, wow. No kidding. So That's amazing. The, that year was the most brutal year with that 13,000 feet of climbing. Uh, mm-hmm. Only 26 finished. All three of us finished. Yay. <laughs> and That's that was rights. pretty good. And it's like, I, I hear this uh, speech from Kamala Harris uh, and, the, and uh, a recent speech when mm-hmm. they uh, uh, won this or it's still debating, but they got mm-hmm. the majority. Yeah. I might be the first, but I will not be the last. Mm-hmm. I love that. So, so it's like, that. just like, an, yeah. I might be the first, but the thing is, I'm not going to be the last. So I started like training uh, some athletes, like mm-hmm. uh, I, I coach. So it, it gives a lot of pleasure and like, you know, fulfillment whenever like you're bringing all your experiences and then giving it to other Indians. That's it's awesome. uh, triathlon is a new sport. Mm-hmm. And extremely, it's like people are like picking up that sport and uh, they're very enthusiastic because it's three disciplines. It's quite a badass thing. So mm-hmm. uh, you think about it and the people want to do new things and, and 
it's 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 a growing uh, uh, sport in in India, mm. and I'm really honored to be one of the starting few who can like contribute or bring. San Diego is like a land, is like birthplace of triathlon. So I get to meet like amazing people. Even yeah. I got to meet, mm-hmm. uh, hang out with the, the with the legends who started Iron Man, yeah. and Judy and John, and then like you know you're taking those experiences and values, and then give it a transfer or like you know pass it on to Indians because a lot of times uh, the see when you look at a sport, it's all about competition. Mm-hmm. I'm me, me, me. I have to get this much. No, it's about lifestyle. It's about uh, an experience. It's about making yourself better. It's about learning a new thing and implementing it in your life. The triathlon teaches a lot of things. I mean, endurance, perseverance, you know, how you take care of each other, help and uh, the love for each other and being honest. And it teaches you integrity you know you can't to stay like i mean you can't cheat you know all these things mm-hmm. you need to pass this on rather than like the moment you get i me my time you lose all those values so mm-hmm. yeah i'm glad to hear that you're you are coaching other indians i think that's amazing because i, I agree with you that triathlon's more than just a you know a sport and it's more about just the, the finishing time there's a whole community around it and it's a lifestyle and so to that end there's you know different cultures there's indian culture african american culture you know caucasian american culture and we might approach the lifestyle slightly differently based on our cultural background so to have um diversity in the sport i think it's you know going forward i think it's important to have leaders like yourself who have a different cultural view and can share that coming to because like you said you know how you show up for the start is the most important thing and and that is going to come down to some cultural thought processes and how you attack you know de-stressing you know maybe different culturally or or how you view your work and prioritize things like that so it's exciting to hear that. And uh, I live in Silicon Valley and I have to say a lot of your people are starting to pick up cycling for sure. And on the Silicon Valley triathlon club, you know, we do have some Indian triathletes now and um, we've got a pretty good mix up here. So it's, it's pretty cool. A um, couple of us, African-Americans, some Asian, Chinese, Indian. I mean, it's, 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 it's amazing to see. Yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely takes some time. I, I saw a lot of uh, Indians from uh, Silicon Valley area doing this uh, Ironman 70 point face Santa Rosa and like short distance races. Mm-hmm. It's quite like, it's, it's beautiful to see them. And uh, whenever I see like, since I've gone through this journey, like by myself, like mostly as trained solo, like I had like two amazing, I mean, like I had amazing coaches uh kurt madden who was the first ultraman world championship winner and i had like Ardis bo she was the first woman ultraman world champion she's mm-hmm. the first finisher so they mentored me and also there was like a serbian coach uh, bo and marik so their experiences their uh philosophies have really like nurtured me in, in a good way and like whenever i see them see other fellow indians what they uh uh, the only thing is there is a gap. Uh, they, what they're seeing is just swim, bike, run rather than like methodologically uh, mm. breaking down each sport and like bring, bringing it, uh, like smoothening it. It's mm. like very rough when they're doing it. Like, you know, they're yeah. going a very rough path. Like uh, whenever I see when I'm running past them, hey, just relax your shoulder. Don't mm-hmm. shrug your shoulder while running <laughs> because that takes down like that, that, uh, restricts your arm movement in running and then that translates to your legs. So mm-hmm. those are a few things which a lot of us don't know. Oh, oh, oh. My we got you. Phone. No, no, it's like my phone is uh, shutting down. Oh. Oh. <laughs> well, I think, uh, Mon, we, we need to get you back on this show. Um, the, the sign of a good conversation is that mm-hmm. it feels like it's too short. And I mean, 100%. You know, it's, uh, and Mon, you talked about these pioneers of the sport and, you know, I, I hope you're including yourself as one of these pioneers too, being the first Indian to, to race and the first Indian to finish, uh, yeah. Ultraman world championships. So 
love having you on here and we're going to get you back on soon. So yeah, I think he's possibly frozen, which I mean, his, I have to say, this was one of my favorite episodes we've done. Yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. amazing. He's like a, he's like a triathlon guru yeah. <laughs> type situation. The, it's pretty yeah. Awesome. Beautiful philosophy for the sport. And, um, yeah, it looks like his, his phone shut down, but that's okay. We're going to have him We're back We're going to end on. the show there. I mean, his with his last words, it was it was perfect. Yeah. All right, Lindsay. Well, All right. I will catch up with you next week for another episode of Age Groupies. Bye, guys. Bye. See ya. <laughs>concludes today's episode of the age groupies podcast with me Lindsay hyken and my co-host mike ergo we really hope you enjoyed it you can follow the show on instagram at age groupies join our age groupies page on facebook and look us up by name Lindsay hyken and mike ergo on strava if you have questions comments or topic ideas feel free to email us at age at gmail.com if you enjoy the show please leave a rating and review on itunes or wherever you get your podcast as this really helps us get more exposure while we try to grow this little venture. And of course, if you have friends you think might like the show, please be sure to share it with them. But for now, thanks for listening, and we will talk to you next week.